airway management. This is an important lecture in this lecture series because it deals with the first priority in primary survey which is the airway and the objectives of this lecture are one to identify situations where the airway could be compromised and identify the signs and symptoms of airway obstruction to initiate management of a compromised airway uh, we also need to define the definitive airway and how to establish a definitive airway also mention the importance of cervical spine immobilization during airway management Airway compromise results in inadequate oxygen delivery and it's a rapid cause of death in trauma. And hypoxemia can be prevented only if we have a patent protected airway and if we give adequate ventilation. And in trauma, either of these could be affected. All trauma patients require supplemental oxygen because enriching the blood with oxygen helps improve their perfusion and oxygenation. Deaths from the airway can result from uh, one, inability to recognize the need for an airway or inability to establish one, establishment of an airway improperly, displacement of an unsecured airway, then failure to recognize the need for ventilation and aspiration of gastric contents. Those are six situations of complications with the airway. And the airway can be compromised either suddenly or slowly, insidiously, or progressive and recurrent. And monitoring is essential in order to guarantee that our airway is protected. And we do this by pulse oximetry and vital signs. Usually, hypo hypoxemia will result in tachypnea and tachycardia. Airway management, in primary survey stands for A and B. And these are the most important priorities in the management of a trauma patient. The trauma airway is generally difficult because of situations where the airway could be compromised. For example, if a patient has got a maxillofacial trauma, we'll have a hemorrhage and obstruction from loose teeth or broken facial bones. Neck trauma, which could result in direct injury to the airway or an expanding hematoma of a carotid injury which can compromise the airway and not to forget cervical spine injury which we usually assume in every trauma patient patients injured in uh, motor vehicle crashes for example and this uh, needs immobilization which complicates airway management or patients with head injury because they usually unconscious and or semi-conscious and they have problems keeping a patent airway. When we get the patient, the first thing we do is assessment. We look, listen, and feel. We look for any injuries of the head, face, or neck. We listen for any abnormal sounds like strider, grunting, or ronchi, and we feel for tracheal deviation. We also inspect the neck for descended neck veins. The next thing we do is, in intervention, we open the airway, and we can do this in two ways, either jaw thrust, using the jaw thrust maneuver, and when we do this, we must ensure inline cervical immobilization, or, or we could do head tilt chin lift. We do jaw thrust for patients who are likely to have a cervical spine injury, but if a cervical spine injury is ruled out, then we can do a head tilt chin lift. We then insert, an airway, either oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal, depending on whether the patient has a gag reflex or not. After that, we bag the patient if they so require. If patients have poor ventilation, shallow breathing, or tachypnea, or if they are hypercarbic, then we bag them. Otherwise, we could just put them on oxygen by mask and continue with other interventions. And this is how we insert an oropharyngeal airway. In breathing, the assessment for breathing again is look, listen, and feel. And what we look for, signs of respiratory distress, chest excursion and asymmetry or symmetry. Then we check for respiratory rate and whether the neck veins are distended. And we listen for breath sounds on both sides. And we percuss the chest 
for any abnormal percussion note. And we also put the patient on a pulse oximeter to see whether the oxygenation is adequate. Then we institute management accordingly by giving them supplemental oxygen and any other required intervention. When we assess for breathing, we're actually assessing for two parameters, oxygenation and ventilation. We assess for oxygenation by checking physical signs, for example, cyanosis. We use a pulse oximeter and we do arterial blood gases. And we check for ventilation by examining the chest, checking for chest mechanics, checking whether the patient is getting fatigued on respiration and also arterial blood gases. Patients who have got uh, compromised airway or breathing need a patent protected airway which is established by endotracheal intubation. And the definitive airway is established in the following situations. When the airway is not clear, when the patient cannot be trusted to maintain or protect their airway, for example, intoxicated patients or unconscious patients, when the natural cause of injury can result in airway compromise, for example, a patient with a neck injury with an expanding hematoma or a patient with facial burns, and when the patient is required to go through investigations and so requires the air to be protected from the word go. And this is especially so for seriously injured patients who are usually also semi-conscious. This can be summed up in the following indications. Unconscious patients, patients with severe maxillofacial injuries, patients who are intoxicated, for example, who are at risk of vomiting and aspiration, and patients who are at risk of obstruction with neck injuries or expanding neck hematoma. The trauma airway is difficult for the following reasons. Because of bleeding and secretions, and because of altered mental status, usually patients are combative or unconscious. And also, because of the use of a cervical collar, it's much more difficult to intubate a patient. Unlike, for example, a patient for elective surgery in theater. It is therefore necessary to have an alternative plan, plan B, and even plan C, which is usually a surgical airway, in case our intubation attempts fail. This is how cervical spine immobilization impedes intubation. In the first diagram, the patient's neck is immobilized and the axes of the airway are not aligned. And the ideal situation is to achieve the situation shown in the second diagram where the oropharyngeal, pharyngeal and tracheal axes are aligned for ease of intubation, which is usually difficult if a patient's neck is immobilized. The method of choice in trauma is orotracheal intubation. It is much easier, and as shown in the previous diagram, it is easy to achieve, and it is usually used in patients who have a cervical spine injury and who require inline immobilization. In this case, we could remove the cervical collar, but make sure that we support the neck while we intubate and it is contraindicated in tracheal disruption. For combative patients and for pediatrics or patients who are unconscious or semi-conscious, we usually do rapid sequence intubation. This illustrates the procedure of rapid sequence intubation. We oxygenate the patient. We then give certain drugs for sedation and uh, we can give atropine to prevent bradycardia and also to reduce the tracheal secretions. We then paralyze the patient using scoline, scopolamine because it's a short-acting neuromuscular agent, and then intubate the patient. In nasotracheal intubation, this is much more difficult and is contraindicated in patients with the respiratory arrest, maxillofacial injury, basal skull fracture, and any patients with coagulopathy. The trauma airway is normally difficult. About 0.1% of patients cannot be intubated even after attempting uh, several times and a failed airway is normally defined as the airway that when we are unable to intubate, intubate after three attempts by an expert. And the emergency medical data shows that this is more common in trauma.
for the reasons alluded to above. The difficult airway can be anticipated in patients who have a, a neck or low face injury, or patients who are obese or have a short neck, patients who have a small jaw, patients with limited cervical movements, for example, those who have a C collar, which cannot be removed, or patients who are not able to open their mouth or who have a large tongue. In those patients, plan B could involve fiber optic intubation where the endotracheal tube is introduced under direct endoscopic vision or by retrograde intubation where we do a cricotherotomy and use a guide wire to guide the endotracheal tube. Of course, this, this take much longer and we resort to them only after failing the first because they are more certain ways of intubation. Or you could use a laryngeal mask airway and this is an, a laryngeal mask airway which lodges in the pharynx and without getting into the trachea but it's possible to bug the patient using this device. It's also used electively in surgery. If we are unable to do this then we consider cricothyrotomy which is plan C surgical airway and in this uh, case we identify the cricothyroid membrane which is between the thyroid and cricoid cartilages and we make an incision in this and insert a cannula as shown. The surgical airway is indicated when intubation is not feasible or has failed and this can be cricothyrotomy or tracheostomy. Tracheostomy is an elective procedure usually much more difficult to do in the emergency setting. We could also do needle cricothyrotomy, which is a real very temporary procedure just to access the airway and this is usually in situations of upper airway obstruction that cannot be relieved. This is a gadget that we use for needle cricothyrotomy and jet insufflation. In summary therefore, airway problems are common in trauma and this is because of injuries to the head, to the neck, and to the face. Patients who have a difficult airway often need a definitive airway. Remember, the plans for a definitive airway, A is intubation, plan B is other methods of intubation or other airway devices, laryngeal mask airway, and plan C is surgical airway. Thank you for your attention.